very much for inviting me to come. And it's uh, it's it's been a wonderful. We had a great train trip down this morning as well. So it was a uh, it was really uh, really nice to be here and nice to meet all of you. Um, so yeah, I I would like to sort of share some of the research that we've been doing in the Serengeti ecosystem. The Serengeti, like Andy said, was probably one of the best studied ecosystems in the world. Um, I lead the Serengeti Biodiversity Program, which was started in 1964, and it's a continuously studying program on various aspects of, of ecological processes. And what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about some of the things that we've learned in that period of time, and also um, hopefully get some of your insights about things that we should be studying in this ecosystem as well. So I'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, we're going to have questions at the end, but if you have a burning question right away, also just jump in and ask me if I'm not being clear about something. Um, I also just want to point out as well that uh, what you'll see in this presentation are a whole series of different people that we've been working with, all at different stages in their career. Some master's students, welcome, <laughs> um, who have graduated from the university, some uh, PhD students, research fellows, uh, postdoctoral researchers, and also, um, you know, other professors as well that we work with. So a whole gamut of people, and I'll try and give credit to people as we progress through. Um, okay, I think we all kind of agree. There we go. We'll all agree that we're in some form of an ecological crisis right now. Um, we're losing not only species and habitats at an unprecedented rate, but we're also losing uh, ecosystems and the functionality of those ecosystems. In other words, the functionality on which we ourselves actually depend. Um, and one of the things is that, you know, while, while we're losing these aspects, you can see very clearly from these images that the, that the difference between inside and outside protected areas is very clear. Um, I don't know if people online can, this pointer should, you should be able to see that. So inside and outside protected areas. Very clear to see, but what's less clear are the ecological implications of that. So we've got decades and decades of research on ecological function, things like um, competition, facilitation, predation, multiple stable states, all of this key foundational theory, which is based inside the core of protected areas. But what we see consistently are that those processes that maintain an ecosystem, that maintain the resilience of an ecosystem and the stability of an ecosystem decay as you get to the edge of the ecosystem. And those processes are really fundamental. And it's not that we're losing ecosystems from the core, we're losing ecosystems from the edges. And so what is it driving that this, these, these decay of process of these, these fundamental ecological processes at the edges of these ecosystems? Of course, if you're going to have a midlife ecological crisis, which perhaps I might be having, I don't know, but these are the things that keep me up at night, okay? Ecological problems are often very difficult to comprehend because quite often what we see is the cause and the effect are delayed. And in fact, they're delayed sometimes by a few weeks or months, but they could also be decades and in fact, even half a century. And that means that because they're delayed, we don't know when they're going to take effect. So you don't know exactly when you're going to see the effect. And the other point is, is that um, the things that we do now may only be seen in the next generation. And the way that we manage now is actually the product of how it was previously managed. So these delayed effects are, are something that are quite tricky to capture. <laughs> Displaced effects. Quite often what we see is a cause in one part of the ecosystem or an edge of the ecosystem, but the effect somewhere else. In other words, they're not spatially disconnected, they're connected, but you don't see the cause and effect in the same place. And that's quite often because that's mediated by animal movement. Okay, so animals are displaced and chained. We also see these disproportional effects. Ecosystems are notoriously resilient, all right? I mean, we can put in invasive species and we think, oh my God, it's gonna be the end of the world. And suddenly the ecosystem kind of keeps going. We can pull a species out of a network um, and, and quite often this ecosystem keeps on going. But at some point you pull out something and then the whole thing changes, it shifts into a completely different state. And so these non-linear disproportional effects is quite tricky to capture. 
So what I would like to do in the talk today is kind of address um, how we in Serengeti are dealing with delayed effects, displaced effects, and disproportional effects, and how we can actually measure those in the ecosystem. And again, hopefully this might give you some ideas for your own research, but I'd love to hear your ideas about how we can improve this as well. Okay. So to Serengeti, um, that's where we are up in the UK. This is the Serengeti ecosystem here. Um, it's just below the equator. It lies between Kenya and Tanzania. Um, and this is the protected area boundary here. What I wanted to illustrate is that the majority of the ecosystem is actually on the Tanzania side, but the animals are free to move on both sides. These two areas are managed completely differently. Two different countries have two different types of management. The other thing I wanted to point out is what we're showing here in the around is the human density, okay? So in some areas, we're up to almost 1,300 people per square kilometer. 1,300 people per square kilometer. That's very high density of people. Um, and these primarily are <laughs> agro-pastoralists, people who grow crop and have, uh, have uh, livestock. On this side, we have primarily pastoralist people. So we have two different ways in which people are interacting with the ecosystem and several different ways in how it's managed. And that allows us to tease apart the effects of, of what, what constitutes good management, what are human, the human impacts on these ecosystems. So think of this almost as sort of an experimental layout. Um, I realize that's quite old data, but we do have the, the most recent census actually was 2022. So uh, during, well, they tried to do it at the end of COVID. So it is not exactly, we're not unsure about the quality of the data. So what I want to show you here, um, this dotted line represents Kenya on this side of the ecosystem and Tanzania on this side of the ecosystem. And what we're looking at here are different um, different districts in those areas and the density of human population, okay? And this is within 60 kilometers of the park boundary. So 60 kilometers comes to about here. Actually, this might be 60 kilometers that we're showing here. Right? But what I want you to see is that in 1999 and 2009, what you see is a steady increase in people, okay? Now, if I just look at the closest 15 kilometers of the park. So in other words, I just take a very good position. <clears throat> what I want you to see here is that the rate of growth within 15 kilometers of the national park is actually much greater than the national average. So human populations at the edge of this ecosystem are growing faster than the national average. People are growing, more people coming to the edge of this ecosystem than what you'd expect from the national average. Right. This is some work actually, I should point this out. Mikhail was a postdoc at the time, um, uh, and Han uh, is a professor of uh, conservation ecology in the University of Groningen. Um, and this is some work that we published in science in 2019. Um, this is a continuation of the work. And what I wanted to show you here is um, the, the effect of humans on resilience. What I'm showing you here is NDVI. NDVI is a metric of the grass greenness. Okay, NDVI is a metric of the grass greenness. Now, grass when it grass gets green only one way, rainfall or spring. In in uh, in Tanzania, this is driven completely by rain. Um, but it can lose you can lose greenness in two different ways. Either it can become dry, or it gets consumed. Okay, so you lose you lose NDVI by either because it becomes dry or becomes consumed. What I'm showing you here is actually not just the NDVI, but the rate of change of NDVI. So in other words, between consecutive scenes, how quickly is it drying or, or being able to recuperate, okay? So effectively, I mean, think of this as, as the system's ability to recover after a rainfall, okay? So if I have a, a ball and I'm bouncing that ball, uh, the green areas are locations where the ball is bouncing very strongly back. As the ball gets a little bit flat, it's not quite bouncing back after a season, okay? And those are the red areas. The red areas are where the ball isn't quite bouncing the same sort of way. So I want to zoom in into two areas, into these little gray blocks here on the edges of the National Park and see what's going on there. 
So what we did is we mapped out, these are the locations of all the pastoralist livestock bomas. So these enclosures for livestock. Um, and what you can see is that the areas with high densities of livestock actually are associated with this, these red areas, this lack of resilience. So in other words, high densities of livestock are consuming all the grass. It grows and it's getting consumed almost immediately. On this side of the ecosystem, these are actually illegal cattle paths coming into the ecosystem. So if you zoom in on Google Earth, you can actually see roads effectively, which are actually cattle paths, and you can map them all out. Um, and what you see is the density of cattle paths are very strongly associated with that. Now, um, obviously, in this ecosystem, we've got, well, we just did the census, um, and it's 1.36 million wildebeest. That's quite a lot of animals. 1.36, I can say it very easily. But try and imagine 1.36. Try and imagine it this way, and I think this is about the best way to do it. If I took a wildebeest, a wildebeest, and I put a wildebeest's nose on the next wildebeest's bum, and I had a wildebeest chain, and I started here in Cambridge. Do I get to Glasgow? Yeah, definitely. Do I get to Amsterdam? Yes. Barcelona? Yes. Paris? Yes. I get from Cambridge to Casablanca. Cambridge to Casablanca, one line of a single species of animal, 1.36 million animals. That's a huge number of animals. It's a, in fact, it's, it's, it's difficult to comprehend how many animals of that one species there are in this one ecosystem. Now, these animals are consuming about 4,800 tons, 4,800 tons of grass per day. 4,800 tons of grass per day. So in other words, this ecosystem has to grow more than 4,800 tons per day because it's got about 300,000 wildebeest. I'm sorry, zebra. It's got about 250,000 gazelle. It's got all kinds of other herbivores, lots of different species. So it's growing a massive amount of grass, but it's been consumed, 4,800 tons of grass. To put that into some other form of perspective, imagine you had a Tesco delivery truck delivering bales of hay. 3,600 Tesco delivery trucks a day. A lineup of Tesco delivery trucks 32 kilometers long, bumper to bumper. Okay, so that gives you some perspective about what's going on here. So we have this huge abundance of animals going through. And what you're actually seeing here, what we think is happening here, uh, this area is here. We're seeing these patches where the bull is no longer bouncing in the same way. There's no livestock there, but the bull is no longer bouncing in the same way. And we think it's because the animals are getting squished. You're ending up with this very high abundance of animals concentrated into small areas. And so fundamentally, what I want you to take home here is that we're losing some form of resilience. But what we're also seeing is that the cause and effect are spatially displaced. The cause happening on the edge, the effect seen in the core. Something happening on the edge, and you're seeing a response in the core, not where you expect to see it, but that's mediated by animal movement. Okay, and just to sort of express this a little bit more, this is Cyrus Cavele's work. He's just finished his PhD. He's back in Kenya uh, with a lectureship at uh, Karatina University. Um, and what we did with Cyrus is we set up a whole series of camera traps uh, perpendicular to the park boundary, because we wanted to see how are animals reacting to the park boundary. So panel A is this point here. Um, and you can see that's the park boundary there. In fact, I should be doing this online, shouldn't I? So that everybody online, that's the park boundary. That's the boundary there. Panel B, um, which is over here, um, you can see the boundary right there. And then these two, A and B, are hard boundaries. There's no buffer zone. That's a hard boundary to the protect, from protected area to human dominant. Panel C is a soft boundary, okay? This is a buffer area this pastoral land use area. And so what we did is we looked to see um, as a function of the distance to the park boundary, so zero is you're on the park boundary to 10 kilometers into the park boundary, we looked to see the observation probability of any of the migrants, wildebeest and zebra. And what you see is on the park, on the areas that are the hard boundaries, 
is you tend to see very few animals actually on the edge of the national, of the edge of the boundary, right? On the edge of the hard boundary, but more coming in. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And of course, you don't see any response with a buffer area. The point here that Cyrus found is that there's about 17.4% of the national park is actually has a hard boundary, 129 kilometers unprotected boundary. You see the effect of the boundary going in five, six, seven kilometers. So effectively, what's happening is that we're preserving that national park, but ecologically, the, 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 the effective size is much smaller than the geographic size is what I'm trying to say. So the geographic size of this protected area, um, you know, 20,000 square kilometers, but in actual fact, ecologically, it's actually much smaller because animals aren't using these areas, okay? Okay. Right, so I'm gonna put that into a little bit of perspective, give a little bit more framework for the rest of the talk that kind of gives you a little bit of, a, of, an, of an idea about the human impact on this ecosystem and how we're trying to measure it. So traditionally, historically, this is how we think about things. We've got areas where it's dominated by humans and we've got areas dominated by wildlife and we've got some protected area boundary in between. Um, typically the areas out in human dominated landscapes aren't very pristine whereas inside uh, these protected areas, they tend to be more pristine. So, um, and in these areas here, there's this sort of area of overlap where, um, where animals sometimes come out in the drought, they occupy human dominated landscapes and people come into the protected area to use resources in extreme situations. That was what's happening historically. What we're seeing now is this hard boundary coming in, human populations coming right up to the edge. Our current thinking, is that there's no ecological loss. That humans living right up to the edge of a protected area has no net ecological loss. And yet what we're finding is something actually quite different. What we're finding is actually you end up with higher densities of animals inside the core protected area and this big displacement and also potential loss of resilience because of that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what I would like to do is, um, sorry, that's actually mediated by animal movement. So what I'm gonna do is start looking to see how do animals respond with individual behavior to this barrier, to, to humans primarily? How do they respond physiologically? I'm not gonna go into the aspects of collective behavior or population dynamics, we'll leave that, but we're gonna focus on these two here, individual, behavior and uh, physiology, okay? Okay, so if you want to know how an animal responds to the boundary and how animals respond to humans, the best thing to do is ask the animal, right? Ask the animal. But of course, none of us are wildebeest whisperers. That's not what we do. But what you can do is you can put on GPS collars on tab. So we've been putting on GPS collars on the wildebeest migration since 1999. Um, and that's been almost continuous. We had a few years without funding, when that happens. Um, and, uh, and that allows us to track these animals over space and time, okay? That's actually a dart going into this zebra. Um, and uh, that's what a collar looks like. And this is the, our veterinary team and um, some of our team out tracking, tracking the animals in the field. Um, okay, so when you get, I don't know how many of you have used GPS data before, um, so this might be, um, I'll, I'll go through this anyhow. What you typically get from GPS data are a series of locations, time series of locations. And, um, and not only are you getting the location, but you can also calculate the distance between consecutive points. In other words, the speed of the animal, how quickly it's moving between areas. And you can calculate the angle of turn. So in other words, if I'm walking like this in a steady pace, it kind of feels like maybe an animal is migrating or, or vacating a, a spot or looking for something. Whereas an animal that might be doing this type of movement, this tortuous movement, could be doing something like this, turning and grazing again, lingering in an area. So a different type of behavior, okay? So fundamentally, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what what leads an animal to behave like this? In other words, to be, you know, encamped in an area and what leads an animal to leave an area? 
Okay, what are the environmental and, and landscape features that allow for encamped versus departure? That's fundamentally how, how animal movement uh, works in a nutshell. Um, but in order to do that, you need to be able to measure all kinds of things about the environment. Um, and, uh, and that's quite challenging. So we've got about 148 plots across the Serengeti that we repeatedly measure. So this is uh, about 250 kilometers from this end to this end. It's about 20,000 square kilometers altogether. And we go back and we measure these ve the vegetation in these plots repeatedly, and we can measure things like grass protein. So in other words, the nutritional quality of that grass. We can also measure things like the, estimate the amount of grass biomass. Uh, what I want to show you here is one is two things: this relationship between quality and quantity of grass. Herbivores have a very difficult time actually breaking down cellulose. It's actually quite challenging to break down cellulose because you've got to ferment it, and fermentation means that you need to have a big gut. Okay, and so. The, the best way to do that for ruminants is you have the four-chambered stomach, right? And they ferment it slowly. Equids do a very different thing. These are the zebra, and I'll show you that shortly. But the point is, is that when grasses are growing, at the very initial stage, they're very high in protein. They're super high in protein because they don't have any structure to them. As they start growing, you look at a hay field, and you think, there's plenty of grass here. Yeah, it's, there's plenty of grass, but it's not very high quality because it's full of lignin, it's full of cellulose, it's not full of protein. And what they want is the protein. And so what I want to point out here is, um, if you look at these areas, high grass biomass, they tend to have low quality, yeah? And areas with low grass biomass tend to have very high quality. So there's this trade-off between quality and quantity of the food. So from a wildebeest perspective, not, not all grass is the same. Some grass is better than other grass, okay? Just remember that. The other thing you want to do from a wildebeest perspective is try and get some aspect of risk. Because if you're moving around this landscape, you're not just looking for food, you're also looking for safety. You're trying to avoid all the predators. So what we've got here is woody cover. This is a satellite image that we've ground truth with a bunch of data. Now, let me explain a little bit on why this is important for predation. The main predator in Serengeti are lions, um, and lions are very, very clever at ambush hunting. They're terrible at running things down. <laughs> so for a, for a lion to be successful in a hunt, it's got to get within 15 meters of, of a prey, right? I mean, that's effectively from this side of the room to that side of the room, from that side to that, okay? And the way that they can do it is they duck down behind things and they sneak up on things, right? They're in behind all the obstacles. Vegetation is excellent for lions, right? So a lion, if it gets within 15 meters of, uh, of a prey, and then it, it basically out accelerates everything. It can out accelerate almost everything, but it can't run things down. So it's got 15 meters to out accelerate its prey and catch it. About 30% of the time, they're successful when they get within 15 meters. Beyond 15 meters, they're very rarely successful. So woody cover is associated with predation risk, uh, particularly for things like wildebeest and zebra and relation to violence. There's a whole series of other aspects of the, of the landscape that's also associated with predation, where rivers converge, for instance. Lions are much more likely to catch a prey where rivers converge because those form natural traps. They funnel animals together. So they form natural traps. The Serengeti has these large rocky outcrops distributed all across it. <laughs> is that lions are much more likely to make a kill within the viewshed of a large rocky outcrop because they can see the prey. Then they get down, sneak up towards it. Okay. Um, erosion terraces, these embankments, things like that. So there's a whole series of features. And if you map them all out, you find areas that are quite good for lions. Um, and if you flip that coin around, hypothetically, those are areas that are probably not very good for wildebeest, right? Good lion habitat is probably not good for wildebeest. So we've got a few different metrics of natural risks. We've also got a few metrics of human risks. Um, this is the, um, the, the density of human populations around, which I've already shown you some of the data. This is agricultural fences that have been expanding in Kenya, coming all the way down to the edge and it taking over all these uh, once protected areas, uh, private agricultural fences that are blocking the migration. 
We've also got huge investment by tourism as well. This is a tourism. Okay, so we've got, we've got all these layers. Now you want to throw your GPS data at it, and you want to say, what is predicting how an animal either vacates an area or stays in an area? Okay, so I'll just start with this one. This is a, a giant gazelle. This is an eland that we call her. Um, and what I want you to what I want you to point, see here are there's effectively two different life history strategies, and we see this consistently with every single migratory animal that we have in Serengeti. There's five different species that migrate in Serengeti. Everybody thinks of wildebeest, but there's four other species that actually migrate. So here we've got a resident animal that never leaves, and here we've got a migrant that does this sort of sudden movement from the southern plains down here straight up into Kenya. Very linear type of movement. Compare that to zebra. Oh, sorry, I'm going to compare it to zebra, but I want to show you some data first. <laughs> okay, so what we're seeing here is this is the selection uh, strength, okay? One effectively means there's no selection. If you're above one, it means that an animal is selecting that resource. If you're below one, the animal is avoiding that resource. And we're measuring, you know, the NDVI, the woody cover, the distance to drainage. I'm not going to bore you with all the things we're measuring. But what I do want you to see is that the two factors related to people are probably the strongest. That's for an eland, right? This is the distance to a road. The further you are from a road, the more likely you are to find an eland. Interestingly, this is the distance to a ranger post. The closer you are to a ranger post, the more likely you are to find an eland. So there's some perception of human activity in this, in this population. Now I want to compare it to zebra. I jumped ahead of myself. This is zebra, a hindgut fermenter, right? They are fermenting. Uh, they, they don't have the ruminant-style stomach. They're a very much less efficient uh, way of uh, digesting their food. They have to eat high biomass protein, like a horse, okay? So a couple of things when you look at the zebra movement, while, while they're up here, uh, where are they going? Okay, let's go down here. Let's start here. They very rarely come out into these areas here, okay? This is the long grass plains here. This is the short grass plains. And by short grass plains, I mean golf course. The grass doesn't get much higher than maybe 10 centimeters. And it never gets higher than 10 centimeters. Not, in, not, not since you know, the 60s, since we've been measuring it, has it ever got higher than 10 centimeters. It's always very short. And that's because there's very low rainfall out here. But zebra very rarely go there because there's just simply not enough biomass. It's high quality food, but there's not enough. Food. The other thing I want to point out, is look what's happening up here. There's hard boundaries. They don't go anywhere close to it, right? They come all the way up here, but they're not getting close to it. Even these boundaries down here, the soft boundaries, they are, okay? But not the hard boundaries. Again, uh, what I'm showing you here is a whole pile of data, uh, but what I, want to, what I want you to see is this panel here. This is the distance to the nearest village. What we're seeing in all these other aspects, grass quality, distance to the nearest day, uh, drainage, grass quality. You see quite a lot of variation in how animals are responding to that. Yeah, But they're all very consistent, ex except for Z29. I don't know what she was thinking. Uh, but, but they're very consistent. They're, they're consistently avoiding distance to villages. So a very strong response to humans. You know, when we watch National Geographic, they would make you think that the scariest predator on the savanna is a lion. And I'll tell you what, the evidence suggests the scariest thing on the savanna is you. That is the scariest thing that an animal comes across. Okay, now we get on to the best animal in the world. Uh -huh. Yes, wildebeest. Okay, here we have this movement of 1.36 million animals, just a handful of collars that we've got on them. Um, uh, again, you've got a resident population out here that very rarely moves. We've got another migration up in here coming into the Mara. That one has collapsed in the last five years as we've been monitoring it. 140,000 animals down to 15,000 animals. It's Kenya's last migration and it's gone. Kenya used to have a lot of migrations, but this is the last one and now it's actually gone. So this is, these are the remains of it. And in fact, you can see one animal there stuck in a fence, right? Stuck inside a fence as we were monitoring. Okay, so for wildebeest, one thing I want to show you is um, 
Again, they're tending to avoid these areas up here, but they're zipping around all over the place. Look how quickly they're moving. Very different from the wildebeest, from the zebra and eland. They're also capitalizing on these short grass plains, these super nutrient rich areas. So remember, these animals are are you know 1.36 million in in uh, in abundance, eating 4,800 tons of grass a day. Okay, so let's just look to see what I'm uh, how they're responding. So a little bit different from the previous figures. What we're showing you here is the kilometers you move every day. So how far are you moving every day as a function of your distance, the D stands for distance, so your proximity to humans, your proximity to high biomass patches, your proximity to some aspect of predation risk, and grass nitrogen, your you know, the, the, bio, the, the, the nutritional quality, the protein of the grass. Very strong response to humans, very strong and concerted response. And yet when you look at predators, lions, all the big scary stuff, hardly any response at all, very little response. Now, each one of those collars, when we go and track a collar, you might think that's quite easy. You listen, you know, get the GPS location, you go and find it. When you get to the location where an animal is, it's very rare to have anything less than 50,000 animals in that herd. So it's one animal in 50,000. It's quite common to find it in a herd of 100,000. 100,000 animals in a herd moving together. It's no wonder you're not very scared of predators, right? You've got, you've got nothing to fear. If I'm going with 100,000 other, other people and one, one of us is going to get killed, it's not, not going to be me, Bob. You know? Grass nitrogen, that's an interesting one. Look at this, very strong response to grass nitrogen. So capitalizing on protein, capitalizing on protein. Now, what we're seeing here, I don't know if anybody's picking this up, but you're moving further when you're closest to the grass nitrogen, which doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense. You, you're, you're moving along and you find the ideal patch. Why would you leave? You should be encamped. This is where you should stay. This is where you should see this tortuous movement. And yet we're seeing the exact opposite, right? And that's because you're there with 50,000 other grazers who are trying to find exactly the same food that, you're, that you have. Maybe even 100,000, maybe even 500,000. It's like, it's like going to like a flash mob. Let's just pretend one of the pubs here opened up and said, free pint, right? And they just told us, we'd probably all rush off and go and get a free pint. At least I hope you would, right? <laughs> if it got onto the social media and everybody knew there was a free pint there, chances are you're not gonna get a free pint, right? So there's no point in going. But if every pub in Cambridge did it at the same time, then our strategy would be hit that pub. If it's full, go to the next one, move quick. Right? And that's what wildebeest are doing. This is, this is effect of density dependence. Now, the other problem that I want to point out here is that look at the response of humans, what we think is fear. In other words, you move quickly away from a risk and hunger. You move quickly towards finding new food. We've got the same response, but for two completely different reasons. Right? I mean, imagine watching you're sitting down to watch Netflix and that little dial is going around and you think, ooh, I could do with a cheese sandwich right about now. And you run off to the fridge and you get a cheese sandwich, yeah? All I'm measuring is how quickly you're running. Now let's say you're sitting on your sofa and you're watching the little dial go around and suddenly you hear a brick or somebody breaking in through the back door, right? You're running out the front door quickly, right? So it's exactly the same response. One is for fear, one is for hunger, right? So all we're measuring here is, is the movement. So fundamentally, what we want to do is we want to capture something about the physiology of the animal. And this is where we're going to start talking about tail hairs and our work with tail hairs. So how do we, ideally, what we want to capture is this difference between are you scared or are you hungry, okay? We do a lot of postmortems. The other thing National Geographic would have you believe is that if you're a wildebeest in Serengeti, you die from a predator. You don't. Number one cause of death in wildebeest in Serengeti is starvation. 
Most animals die of starvation. Sometimes when we come across a carcass, it's pretty easy to just to figure out how it died because you end up with something like this. You know, you've got you know a few guilty <laughs> suspects looking around here. Um, sometimes you have no idea how it died. Okay, and all you find is a carcass that looks a bit like that. Um, one of the things that happens when wildebeest die or any ruminant dies <laughs> is that they start mobilizing the subcutaneous fat first. Okay, if you're starving, the first thing you use is subcutaneous fat. Then you go into the visceral fat. And once the visceral fat is used up, you go into your bone marrow. You dip into the bone marrow, right? And by the time the bone marrow is used up, you're effectively dead. You've got no more energy left. You're a carcass with a pulse, we call it. So this is a healthy animal. You can see its bone marrow here. It looks like butter. I mean, uh, hopefully your butter dish doesn't look like that. <laughs> It comes out, it comes out thick and, and white. And a starving animal comes out almost like soup, like, like bouillon soup. So butter dish and bouillon. Um, this is where um, we start talking a little bit about isotopes. The other thing we collect from every single carcass and from every single uh, animal that we collar is tail hair. Now, tail hair is interesting because as it grows, it's incorporating metabolites into the hair as it grows. So it's a track record of, of, of metabolites. It's incorporating things like isotopes. It's in, incorporating hormones, stress hormones, things like that. So what this is telling us is a diary of the animal over time. Now, Traditionally, nitrogen isotopes are associated with uh, trophic levels uh, and increase up the trophic uh, 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 tier. So predators have a more enrichment than, than herbivores. Wildebeest, however, are obligate grazers. They, they're, they're not gonna eat a carcass, okay? They never eat a carcass. But one thing I want to show you here is that if you analyze the root part of the tail hair, in other words, the most recent part of growth of animals that have died of starvation and animals that have not died of starvation, what you see is an enrichment of nitrogen in the animals that have died. In other words, they're effectively mobilizing their own fat. They're not eating something else. They're eating themselves, right? It's, a, it's an index of, of self-consumption. If you look at that over the period over the, an entire year, so what we have here is the Julian day from zero to 300, uh, well, full year. Um, and what we're looking at here is the partial residual of nitrogen 15. Um, and I've plotted on the calving event, the rut event, and the weaning event. So these are these is, uh, tail hairs from female wildebeest. What you see is that right after calving, they go into this massive starvation swan dive. Okay, They're mobilizing all the fat they can because lactation is expensive. Lactation is very expensive. It's the most expensive thing they do. Everybody thinks the migration is hard work. I tell you what, it's not. Not compared to lactating, right? Animals starve to death when they're lactating. The number of carcasses that we find of, of pregnant, or well, not pregnant, of lactating females that have died of starvation is very, very high. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, huge, it's a huge energetic cost. So what you can see is you can now get this index of starvation over time. So this is some of ISTE's work. She was a master's student working with us. Okay. I'm going to skip over. This is, well, I'm just going to say very briefly, the other things you can measure with tail hair. This is Sabibu's work. She just finished her PhD. She's now working with the Jane Goodall Institute in uh, Kigoma. Um, but one of the other things you can do with tail hairs, you can look at movement. So what uh, what did is she created a sulfur isoscape and looked to see if she could distinguish between animals that are resident from animals that are migrant. And so um, what she's been able to look at here is uh, is these sort of cycles that are happening in these sulfur isotopes to distinguish animals that are movers and animals that are not. The other thing you can do is you can measure stress. Uh, oh, it's warm in here, is it? Am I the only one who's feeling warm? Yeah, it's really warm. <laughs> okay, the other thing you can do is measure stress. Um, and in fact, the reason I know this is from a self-experiment. Um, so I'm gonna explain that to you. And what I did is I, um, I thought, well, if I'm interested in stress, the best thing to do is test it on myself. Um, 
And I also made a contingent on Callum's PhD, <laughs> which oh. is the other thing I could do. So since Callum didn't have very much hair left, I made it contingent that he gives me a haircut and analyzes my hair. Um, and so we did that. Um, Callum cut my hair, and here's my stress over time. Um, so I went through a period of very high stress, and then I went through a period of very low stress. And I thought, that's interesting. What happened during those times? So I went back to my Google Calendar, and I tried to figure out what was going on. And I suddenly remembered, oh, yeah, that was the ERC interview. <laughs> that was the Consolidator Grant interview right there. And this was the holiday a few weeks after. <laughs> so a few things is that it works. You can measure stress in hair. OK. Um, the good news is Callum got his PhD. Bad news, I didn't get the ERC. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Um, OK, so fundamentally, what we want to do is we want to now link this with the GPS data. So every time now we capture an animal, this is Joseph, uh, every time we capture an animal for, for, uh, for radio calling, we also shave half of its tail. So we take it right back to the skin. Half of its tail gets shaved. We then release the animal. We come back a year later, we capture it, and we measure the regrowth. We measure cortisol, uh, we measure nitrogen, we measure sulfur, we measure all types of metabolites in the tail hair because that gives you a diary of the animal. It's as if, it's as if you're asking that animal every day, are you pregnant? Um, do you get enough to eat? Um, are, are you stressed? I mean, it sounds a bit like your mother on the phone, doesn't it? Um, but that's effectively what we get, okay? Okay, so this is more of Callum's work. Um, what we've got here, same individual. Um, this is its starvation signature over time. What you see here is uh, they give birth in February. You see this massive peak of starvation happening and this mobilization of fat. You also see stress levels suddenly going crazy. Okay, up and down, up and down. Stress, no stress, stress, no stress. Okay. Now, because you have the GPS data, and you know the rate of growth of this tail hair, you can then back calculate the condition of the animal in certain species of the migration. So this is, again, the same individual. This is her starvation signature. Here is the calving grounds. These are the, these short grass plains, high, high, high quality short grass plains, the best part of the ecosystem. And she's starving. She's starving in the best part of the ecosystem. That's because she's mobilizing. That's where she's dropped her cup. She's mobilizing all the fat she has. She's eating as much as she can because the sole incentive is you've got to get this little calf who might only be a few days old, 3,000 kilometers around this, the whole ecosystem. And you've got to pack in that calf. You've got to get that calf fat in order to move. So that's what they're doing here. This is the stress of the same individual. High stress some, in some patches in the north, also down here, potentially associated with with calving and lactation. You can do that for a whole series of animals. So this is, um, these are several animals that we've looked at. And this allows you to look at bottlenecks in the landscape. Where are the stressful points for the migration in this landscape? What's happening? Maybe we should be concentrating, you know, some, some form of, of intervention in these areas. Or so what's actually happening in these areas that's so stressful for these animals? So Callum did a preliminary analysis, um, and we were looking at aspects of the grass quality, so the grass nitrogen, the grass biomass, the NDVI, things we've already spoken about. We've got aspects of danger, so your proximity to drainage lines, uh, vegetative cover, your proximity to water. Lions love sitting by water because everything has to drink, um, and it's the best place to make an ambush. You've also got aspects of humans, so proximity to villages, fences, and tourism footprint. And then you've got a few other aspects that we're just looking at, you know, age, resident versus migrant, things like that. The things that are most important are this. NDVI, how green the area is. So that contributes a lot to cortisol. When it gets dry, animals start getting stressed. Where's my next, where's my next meal coming from? Proximity to village and the tourism footprint. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. Again, two human aspects. Um, the other thing that came up was this aspect of dead or alive. So sometimes our radio collared animals die and we look to see what, what was the sequence of events that led you to die and what is the sequence of events that led you to live? 
And you can tell that from the tail hair. How many times were you pregnant before? How long have you been starving for? These types of things. So again, this tail hair allows us to look at these delayed ecological effects, things that happened you know, in the past, and how are they affecting your probability of survival now? It also allows us to look at these cumulative effects. In other words, what happens when an animal is pregnant and starving at the same time and, um, and might be high stress? So several different things all happening at the same time. Right, I've only got a few slides left, um, but I wanted to uh, wrap up on these, these things. So I'm gonna, what I'm showing you here again is the grass protein layer. Hotspots, look at those hotspots. Now what I'm gonna show you is the development of tourism. This is mass tourism. This is recent mass tourism in Serengeti. So this is uh, the development of hotels and infrastructure um, uh, within the national park. And what we've seen is this massive increase in tourism pressure in the last 10 years. Uh, it's gone up about 20 fold tourism. So tourism development on these high nitrogen, nitrogen spots. So let me just, my high quality animation, look at that. Whoa, uh. whoa. Fancy animation. You see that? Those high nitrogen spots, right? Tourism development there. Now what we look at here, we take all the data from 1999 all the way through. Actually, this analysis was done in 2020. So we, we, we should probably add more data to it. Um, and we look to see has, where, have, where were wildebeest? We're looking at the, at the occupancy. Green areas are areas that wildebeest use more frequently than they used to, so 10 years ago, and areas that are used less frequently than, than they used to. Those red areas are not random. You can look at that map and say that is not a random pattern. There is some sort of spatial structure happening there. And in fact, what I did is I actually overlaid the rivers afterwards on ArcGIS, but you can see a clear barrier here. They used to cross that river, but they don't do it anymore. They used to spend a lot of time in the Maasai Mara, but they don't do that so much anymore. This area here in Seren, the core of the national park, they're avoiding, right? Not only that, they're actually, so this is the month across here, and this is the northing, right? How far north you are. And what I'm showing you here is the occupancy. So this is what they used to do in the past. They used to linger in the north for quite some time and then leave. And now what they're doing is they're getting to the north and leaving immediately, right? And we can see that both from this analysis and from this analysis, the occupancy and the timing more. And so telling us the same thing. They're not spending time in the north. Um, so I'm just gonna do another fancy bit of animation here and go back to the tourism, whoa, whoa. back to the tourism and look at that tourism human wildebeest occupancy. That scares me, that honest to God scares me because tourism is how we generate revenue for these national parks and how we support them. And what we're looking at here is a situation in which we could be loving these ecosystems almost to death. That scares me. Okay, so um, I'm gonna end it up there. If you want to track the wildebeest on your phone or on your laptop, we have daily updates here. Um, SerengetiTracker.org. You can also do it on your phone. If you, if, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's compulsive. Um, um, the other thing, I, just a little heads up, is um, we've been working a lot on the global animal, uh, global ungulate atlas, um, and several of you may well have been involved with that. But what we're trying to do is we're creating an, app, an atlas of all the ungulate migrations around the world. This is a five-year project so far. We have a release date, uh, July 15th. So please, just a quick heads up on that. That's in collaboration with the Convention of Migratory Species. Um, and I just wanted to give you a little heads up on that in case some of that is gonna be interesting for you. Um, so a few summaries. Humans consistently have the largest um, effect on the distributions and behavior of these animals. I hope I've convinced you of that that these ecosystems are being lost at the edges um, of, of these areas where we're losing these processes, that the infrastructure inside these areas may also be displacing animals. So human pressure both inside and outside, where are they gonna go? Um, 
I think animals are really responding to risk. And yet so much of our management, the way that we manage areas is all about the resource. We manage for habitat. We always manage for good, good, good quality habitat, but we very rarely manage for risk. And yet animals are responding very strongly to risk, especially to human risk. And so I think one of the take homes here is that in management policies, general management plans, these types of things, it's not just the resource that we should be managing, it's also animals' perception of the risk and how do we measure that. Um, I'm hoping that if any of the animals that you have have nice long hair, maybe you want to maybe you want to analyze hair, but I'm sure you can do it in feathers and all kinds of other things. And also this consideration for these dis <laughs> delayed, dispersed, and disproportional effects. I have a lot of people to thank, and I would also like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Who has some questions now? Go ahead, David. Yeah, it's a very interesting thought. Um, you, were, you were talking about human pressure getting greater on the edges of the of the park, and the uh, ungulates sort of not frequenting yeah. the edge of the park. But what, what, was I right in thinking that you said the population density in the sort of core area had gone up as a result of that? Or was that, did I get that wrong? And if, if so, then why, why is that the case? I think, yeah, I mean, th th that was sort of a graphical representation of what we think is happening. But what we're thinking is, is that if they're not able to distribute over such a large area anymore, and you still have the same abundance, so our population hasn't changed over time. Um, and of course, you know, we're seeing stress and things like that. We're seeing these behavioral shifts, but we're not seeing a demographic response yet. Um, and that's, I think that's a little bit concerning. So we're thinking, well, what must be happening is if you have the same density of animals in a smaller area, it, it, you, you must have this, you know. Might this, be a lag effect. And... Well, you know, that, that also scares me. And every time we do the census, I think, oh my God, is this the year where we see, where we start seeing decline? And you know, it hasn't gone down in, um, it's been about 1.2, 1.3 animals, 1.2, 1.3 million <laughs> animals. <laughs> um, um, since about 1980, yeah, 1984 ish, yeah, and we went down in some of the uh, some of the bad droughts. It comes down, but it comes right back. Um, um, and you know, the ecosystem is just so well designed for wildebeest, and wildebeest are so well designed for this ecosystem that they can grow at about 10 percent a year maximum recruitment. So, so they do pretty well. But at some point, you know, some point things are going to change. And I'll tell you where things are going to change, actually. The Mara River, this area here, is the only place where you get water in the dry season. So that river has to water 1.3 million animals. And in fact, almost more than 1.3. Um, and that river has never stopped flowing in recorded history, except in the last five years, and it stopped three times in the last five years. And I think if it stops, it stopped for a day. If it stops, wildebeest need to drink every four days. If it stops for something like 10 days, I think, we're going to lose 300, 400,000 wildebeest, just like I turn off the lights. It'll happen like that. And everybody thinks that, you know, there's 1.3 million. You can't lose that many. They're a stable population. But there are core, there are core resources that if those things stop, you'll, suddenly you'll find the wildebeest is an endangered species, you know. Curious, what happened to the paper? What's happening? Yeah, the river is, uh, well, there's a lot of things. It, it starts in the Kenyan highlands up here in the Mao forest. Um, and there's a lot of deforestation in the Mao. These areas here have all been converted into agriculture. So there's a lot of um, water abstraction, people taking water off the river. Um, obviously, there's climate issues as well. Um, what we're seeing also from this river is that when we lose the forests, we lose the continuous flow. So even though the rainfall might stay the same, what you're ending up with is all that water rushing off in about a month or two, rather than sort of dragging out for the entire dry season. Um, there's also been a huge amount of land use change here on the Talak watershed as well, similar sort of thing. So it's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it has to do with how we manage, manage our natural resources. Really, really fascinating talk. I was really fascinated. I, was, I really like the, um, um, what you're doing with the tail hair. Mm. Just wondering how you account for um, an incre possible increase in cortisol levels associated with when the the, t the, the hair has been retrieved. Yeah, yeah. I take the animals need to be dotted. And yeah, yeah, that can be stressful. Yeah, and yeah. And, uh, I mean, I was just wondering as well, the, the, the data that you showed yeah. the animal was not as clear as the one 
the from the the data you know that you graciously provided yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are, you, are you saying i'm being selective with my yes no 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 i'll show you i'll show you just thinking about how stress yeah. levels you know in the you know in the yeah. event of collecting that could affect what what you end up recording that's a good, really good question it's a really good question and in fact what actually the, the problem with tail hair is it grows really slowly um and so what we end up with you see these bars that's actually what we measured um so those are the days on under you know the days of the calendar days that we measured and that's because tail hair is growing quite slowly and it grows what we're measuring is about 0.4 of a of a of a centimeter so 0.4 of a centimeter a week so it's not very much. And so what we're doing is we're taking an eight an eight millimeter section, two weeks worth of growth. And so what this is, where is the cortisol? Well, both of them. What you're actually measuring is you're measuring the cortisol, the chronic stress level of that animal over that two week period. So even though one of the problems with cortisol is that is that your cortisol level will change between morning and evening um, and overnight. So it varies a lot in your body. But what we're measuring here is funnel over a two-week period. So have you just had a very stressful period? You know, like just this last two weeks has been really pretty awful <laughs> or pretty good, you know? Um, so we don't have, you know, you can't get daily metrics. And so what we're doing here is we measure there and then we interpolate along those lines. And the interpolated data is what we use here. So we get this variation in color by, by using that interpolation, interpolated line. One of the things that we did do actually is we offset in some individuals, we measured them twice. You measure them for this two week period. Yeah, and then you measure them, you get another bundle of hair from the same individual and you measure it for the, that two week period in between. You know what I mean? Just to see how much variation there is between them. And effectively, what you find is that if you take, it's it's effectively the mean. So, which of course, the linear a linear representation of something that might be variable might not be the best, but that's the best we can do. I think the best way to do this, actually, if we had a lot of money, would be laser ablation, because then you can you don't have to chop it up and do an ELISA test. You just take a thread of hair and you run a laser along it and you ablate it. Yeah, but we're, we don't have that kind of money. <laughs> if you do, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks for a great presentation. Um, just curious about the impact of tourism. Yeah. Um, so this is, the, the study has been done for the entire, uh, both parks, the yeah. whole area. But I'm just curious if any studies have been done in terms of localized tourism initiatives uh, where you have looked at before and after the setting up of a tourist camp or after the closure of a tourist camp, if, if uh, yeah. data has been. Well, COVID. Okay. Yeah. yeah, COVID is the perfect experiment. You, you couldn't ask for a better experiment. Did you have the infrastructure there, but turn off all the tourism? You know, if we applied for funding for that, we'd never get it. <laughs> but it happened. It's a it's a natural experiment. Um, and um, I don't know if uh, if you've seen some of the work by Marley Tucker, where she was looking at you know the movement of animals and looking at the effect of COVID. Uh, some animals responded very strongly to it, and others didn't really. Um, what we saw, you know, the wildebeest data was so, you know, it's, there's a lot of confounding features with it. So what I've shown you here, that's the footprint and that's the response that we're measuring. Yeah. Um, what I haven't shown you here, for instance, are all the other covariates that could account for this. So, for instance, rainfall patterns. We know animals are chasing, you know, looking for rain. Um, and so variation between all these things. Um, we're in the process of analyzing that. So this isn't published yet. We're in the process of analyzing that. But, but I think, you know, just looking at the data, that, that spatial mm -hmm. correlation to us just really stood out. That's, that to us was kind of hit home. And when you look at changes in NDVI and everything else, it, it doesn't seem to have that, you know, just from a visual inspection, it just doesn't seem to have that. So... Yeah, I mean, the thing would be to do yeah much more detailed analysis. One thing you have mentioned is poaching. Yeah, uh, hunting by people. You talked about cattle and bottom. Yeah, lines. that's is poaching a big problem. It is a big problem. Um, that could explain some of the Yeah, problems. and it's poaching data is um, is well, you you're familiar with this. Um, poaching data is um, uh, sensitive. 
uh, and getting people to share poaching data is a little bit challenging. So the only thing we do have is the proximity to a village. Um, and we have a prox we can also weight that by the size of the village and the ethnicity of that. Some eth ethnic groups are more likely to, to eat bush meat. Other ethnic groups are less fun. Um, so we can weight it that way. Um, but um, as of uh, about 2015, the estimate was about 100,000 wildebeest a year being harvested illegally for poaching. 100,000. So almost 10% of the population. Uh, we think it's gone down now because there's a lot of conservation efforts to move stairs, outreach projects, and so I think it's gone. Hey, online. <laughs> Last one then. Um, so I see you're saying that there's like increase in population in proximity to the park, um, and that might be leading to these responses by the animals. And are there any kind of solutions to try and like bring about better interactions between wildlife and people mm. and like reduce the like you know and enable them to kind of cohabit this ecosystem mm. Mm. um yeah that's a that's a good question and in fact kind of uh almost philosophical actually because i mean what a lot of places do is they just jack up the price you know if you want to go and see gorillas now you're going to pay through your nose to see gorillas right which also raises the question, who are we protecting this for? Are we protecting national parks for the super rich? Only for the people who can afford to come to them. Um, so there is that question. Uh, there is also another way of doing this, and that would be to say, well, you do what some of national parks are doing, is that you pre-book. You know, you pre-book your, your, your trip in, well in advance. You don't just sort of drop in. One of the, uh, the other aspects that national parks are considering two different things neither of them have been implemented, but what they're considering is that you don't buy one day for the national park, because what happens is that most people come in there for a night or two, and then they leave. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very short stay, very short stay. And so what national parks are doing is saying, right, you can go to any national park in the Northern Circuit, but you have to buy a 10-day block. If you, want to spend, if you want to spend one day in the Serengeti and then leave the country, that's fine. The cost is a 10-day block. And for the rest of those 10 days, you can go anywhere else you, you want, but you have you know, a certain amount of time in, in each of these national parks. So you don't sell it by the day, you sell it by a week or a two-week block. The third thing that they're talking about, which is actually something we've been, you know, we're heavily involved in the general management plan, is why do we have all this infrastructure right in the core? You know. We know that these animals are avoiding the edges because of people. We also know that they're avoiding buildings because of people. So why not put them all along here? Because then you have like an, almost a natural barrier. You have a, you, you're, you're solving one problem with the other problem, right? You put national park, you put, sorry, you put lodges all along here when, where you've already got a problem with people, right? And of course, then you can stock your lodges because you have access to the workforce kinds of things like that. So there's a number of solutions we think. Problem is and no investor wants to build wants to build next to livestock. All the investors want to build next to the water hole, on top of the copy, on top of the hill where you can see the carving grounds and scare the living bejesus out of everyone. You know? So so that's where investors want to go. And investors have a lot of money. Thank you.